In the earlier little video, I mentioned the creation stories that are at the beginning of the Bible, the sacred scripture of both Jews and Christians. The very first page of the Bible has that story about God assumed by the author of the story to be outside of a universe that doesn't yet exist. There's some sort of formless void, darkness covering an abyss, a bottomless hole. It's tricky to try to imagine nothing, but the author of the story is trying to help the hearer to imagine absolutely nothing, while at the same time imagining absolutely something. God pre-exists beyond and outside of time, but God wants the universe to be. There comes a moment when God speaks into the abyss and says, let there be light, and there was light. In the seven-day construct of the story, God spends the first three days creating stages, dry land, sea, sky. Then God spends the next three days, days four through six, populating those stages with plants and animals and fishes and birds. Finally, God creates the human beings. At each step of the way, at the end of each day, God stands back from, and like the artist God is, admires the work. God calls it good. Because Biblical Hebrew didn't have a superlative form in the language, there's no way to go from good to better to best. To say best, one just had to say that the creation was good, good. Often that translates as very good. God is perceived to be sort of outside the whole thing, bringing it into being by simply speaking it into existence. Then things become distinct from one another, still a part of a good whole, but also distinct. Everything belongs. From the very beginning, light and darkness both belong. It's not just darkness being obliterated by light because darkness is bad and light is good. Sometimes we speak that way, but for me, I don't believe that. I believe that darkness and light both belong. That's important to me because there are moments in my life that are dark, where I'm confused or sad or grieving. As much as I might like these moments to lighten, I try not to demand that every moment of my life be radiant. I don't think that's really good. Light and dark both belong, and if I'm patient, one turns into the other. Night turns into day. Day turns into night. Both of them are good. I like being awake and alert and being able to do things in the course of a day that I want to get done or enjoy. I also like to rest at the end of the day. And that's exactly what God does at the end of each day, but not before first looking at it and saying, oh, it's good. It's good, good. I believe that this is a fundamentally good universe with goodness all over it. When I'm in a dark place or in some dark circumstance where some evil has been done or hearts have been broken, I try to be still and know that there is good in the darkness. We might like something to be brought into the light, but it's important to be patient. God is in the whole thing. The darkness 
and the light. It all belongs. It's all either good or it will be good. Sometimes I have to look hard to see the good. And seeing in the dark isn't easy. But even the looking is important. Do you see why this is so important in this work with traumatized, stuck souls? They've all been through a destructive experience that ended their lives as they knew them. Everything seems dark and bad and hopeless. My prayer partners and I try to meet these souls in their dark places and help them see. We encourage them to invite the good, especially in the form of someone who has loved them dearly. Well, anyway, as you move through that story, God creates one thing after another. At the end of creating each thing, God looks at it and calls it good. I want to live that way. When I encounter people who I find really problematic, or when I want to join in on the carping and criticizing, I try to do so with the sense that I'm always talking about someone who's inherently good. In our political discourse, for example, it's just so dark much of the time, people speaking so disrespectfully. I try not to refer to political leaders by only their last name because I think that's usually done in a tone of disrespect, like this, Trump, Obama. What about that? In conversation where somebody snarls another person's name, I just try to avoid that without making a big deal of it. I try not to be part of too many conversations that move in that direction. Even if valid ideas are being expressed that are critical of a person's choices or behaviors, I try not to go all dark. That's important to me because if I'm to live as a universal person, I believe I belong to the whole. I belong to the person about whom we're speaking ill or being critical. It's here that some stuck souls have gotten stuck.